Okay, well, the, the um, title of the message this morning is My Redeemer Lives. My Redeemer Lives. Well, happy Resurrection Day to you all. Today we're spending some extra special time celebrating the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came out of the tomb alive. Now, if the Lord Jesus had never come out of the tomb alive, we would have a worthless, useless, pointless faith, just like the other faiths of the Muslims and the Hindus and the Buddhists. We would, we would be, our faith would be no better than theirs, uh, meaning the result would end up the same. But the Lord Jesus did come out of that tomb alive. So the question is, why was he in the tomb to begin with? Well, his lifeless body was placed there after having been crucified a couple days before. And so why was he crucified? Not because he was guilty of anything. He lived, the Lord Jesus lived a perfect, sinless, blameless life. The Lord Jesus voluntarily gave his life on that cross for us. He paid for our sins rather than us going to hell for our sins. He paid for our sins on that cross so that if we trust his righteousness being applied to us by, by believing on him, trusting him, that free gift of salvation, we would spend and will spend eternity in heaven with him. It's the greatest free gift ever. The greatest. Don't you love a free gift? Huh? Don't you? Uh, I'm not, you guys are asleep or what? Uh, okay. All right. J just checking. Uh, getting ready to come and check pulses in a minute. All right. All right. Yeah. You love free gifts. Obviously you do. But often when you hear about gifts, uh, hey, this is free. There's an asterisk, isn't there? But you have to buy this. You have to do this. There's no asterisk when it comes to salvation. It is a gift. It is a free gift. And we're going to talk about that. So that's why he ended up in the tomb. And today we're celebrating even more than we normally do the fact that the Lord Jesus came out of that tomb alive. And how do we K-N-O-W know this? Well, please turn to Mark chapter 16, if you would. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. <clears throat> Everyone there? All right, we're going to begin with verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salem had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him, anoint the Lord Jesus. And very early in the morning, in the first day of the week, they came, which was what day? Sunday, right? Uh, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. It was really big. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said, he saith unto them, be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. They say, you see, he's not there, right? But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. 
neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Okay, so let's stop there for a minute. They didn't believe her. They didn't believe that he was risen from the dead. They didn't believe that he came out of that tomb alive. But what did the Lord Jesus tell them would happen after his crucifixion? Look at Mark 8:31. <clears throat> Excuse me on the screen. And he began to teach them, meaning the Lord Jesus did, right, to them, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And after three days, what are the next two words? Rise, Rise again. Rise again. How about Matthew 17, 22 and 23? And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, the son of man shall be betrayed in the hands of men and they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceedingly sorry. How about Luke 9, 21, 22? And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. So the Lord told them that this would happen, right? The Lord said it. This is what's going to happen. And when the Lord says something's going to happen, can you count on it? Can you trust it? Yeah, with your life, you can. Okay, so returning to our scripture then. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto eleven as they sat at meat, you know, as they were eating, right? And upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So the Lord got on their case for not believing what they had heard. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. 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 So how do we K-N-O-W know that the Lord came out of that tomb alive? Because he said he would and because God's word says he did. Period. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> End of sentence. Okay. <laughs> He's saying amen, pastor. <laughs> so let me share with you by God's grace this morning three reasons why the Easter message is such good news. And I put this in your bulletin as well. Good news, Jesus rose from the dead. Now I want you to stop and think about this for a moment. How amazing that is. The whole history of humanity has been one of death, you know? Everyone has a birth date and everyone has a day that they die. Some die young, some live long, but everyone sees death. It has been that way from almost the beginning. And the Bible says the wages of sin 
is death. Look what God told, told them in the garden from the very beginning. Genesis 2, 16, 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, right? Saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, freely eat. But of the tree of, the, of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And sure enough, when Adam and Eve ate that fruit and disobeyed God, what started happening? People started dying. Things started dying. And so when we read that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, that's good news. Someone finally conquered death. Someone stared death straight in the eyes. Willingly offered himself up to die for us, was placed in that tomb, and on three days, you know, on the third day, came out of that tomb alive, and so that um, we never have to die again. Our bodies might fail us, but we will live forever as believers. And by the way, that somebody that did this wasn't just anybody. That somebody was the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's good news. You know, I read about a tribe that kept the dead bones of their ancestors in a box. Have you heard about this? They kept the bones of their dead ancestors in a box. And the reason they did that is because the hope was that someday they might come back to life. But no one ever did, obviously. And so every now and then they would peek in this box to see if maybe there was some sign of life. And there never was. So they were filled with despair about this. You know, that people kept dying, but no one ever came back. So when missionaries arrived and told them about Jesus and how he came out of that tomb alive, they were overjoyed. They were thrilled. Someone finally did it. And so Easter is good news, first of all, because the Lord Jesus rose from the dead. But then we even have better news. Jesus rose from the dead for you. For you. Look at Romans 4, 23 through 25 up on the screen here. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So we hear that the Lord Jesus died for our sins on the cross, right? And that's true. But the gospel or good news isn't complete if we only focus on his death on the cross. The good news is that not only did he die on the cross for our sins, but he came out of that tomb alive, was raised up for our justification. And justification means having a right relationship with, with God, you know, uh, in his eyes. It doesn't mean you've never sinned again, but what it means is when you believe on the Lord Jesus, you trust his payment for your sins. His payment I mean, his uh, righteousness, the Lord Jesus' righteousness is applied to us so that when, when God sees us, whose righteousness does he see? Ours? No, the Lord Jesus's. You see, it's the greatest deal ever, <laughs> isn't it? We hand him our sin, which he died for on the cross, and he gives us his righteousness. And all we have to do is accept it by faith. You don't have to make an oath. You don't have to swear to never sin again. You don't have to stand on your head, do laps around the building or anything like that. You believe. So just as God took your sins and placed them on Jesus at the cross, so God takes the Lord's righteousness and apply it to us through faith. And that's good news. 
And it was only made possible by the Lord Jesus Christ. So how does the Lord's resurrection bring about justification? Well, think of it this way. What if the Lord Jesus had not risen from the dead? What if he had never come out of that tomb alive? What if he had never come back to life again? What would that mean? It would mean that he wasn't the Lord. You see, it would mean that he wasn't God in the flesh. And if he wasn't God in the flesh, he couldn't have lived a perfect sinless life. And if he didn't live a perfect sinless life, he couldn't have paid for our sins. But the fact that he came out of that tomb alive proves that he's God in the flesh, that his payment was acceptable to the Father. Otherwise, his bones would be there. You see my point? So his, his payment was accepted by God the Father. And we know that because he came out of that tomb alive. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would. 1 Corinthians 15. And if your neighbor is having a hard time find it, uh, finding it, help them, please. 1 Corinthians 15. This, this is um, uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, right? His first letter, at least um, included in God's word. Um, his first letter to the Corinthians. And um, he was addressing various things. And um, you're familiar with uh, who the Pharisees were, right? And then there was another group called the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in a life after death the Sadducees did not. And so the Sadducees were going around yapping, you know, to, well, come on, you know, to, to people saying there really isn't life after death and that kind of thing, right? And Paul heard that this was what was going on, so he addressed it here in this, in, in this part. Okay, everyone there? So we're going to start with verse 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved. Yeah, like, by the way, right? You were saved by this. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again, the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas. When you see this in the New Testament, in the King James, it means Peter. Okay. Then of the 12, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. So 500 people at once saw the Lord Jesus in the flesh after he was crucified of whom the greater part remain unto us present, but some are falling asleep or have died. So in other words, hey, look, some of them are still alive. If you don't believe me, you can go ask them what they saw, who they saw. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, referring to himself, um, Paul as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet or equal to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But, there, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, 
then are preaching vain or useless, and your faith is also vain. So if the Lord had never come out of that tomb alive, we would be wasting our time here. You see, this would be a complete waste of time had he not come out of that tomb alive. But he did. Yea, and we are also found false witness of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he had raised not up, if so be that the dead raised not. So, so in other words, he's saying, you know, if, um, if there is no, no life after death and the Lord Jesus hasn't, hasn't been risen, then we've been lying to you, is what he's saying. For if the dead raised not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Okay, now notice that as well. Hey, if, if what you're saying is true, you are in serious trouble, right? Because you're still in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. So the fact that the Lord Jesus uh, rose from the dead shows that he's the Christ, the son of God. He lived a perfect sinless life. And then because of that, could offer the perfect sacrifice for us on the cross for our sins. And as I said, the fact that he came out of that tomb alive proves that God the Father accepted that, that payment for our sins, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Okay, so that's, that's the better news, right? That, so the good news is that the Lord Jesus um, came out of that tomb alive, the better news is that he came out of that tomb alive for you. And the best news is this. You can spend eternity with the Lord. Amen. Look at Romans 6, 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And you notice the word if at the beginning of that sentence. It means that if you have not accepted that free gift of salvation, then you will not be a part of the resurrection. Right? You will not share in his resurrection. So if you want to share in Christ's resurrection, you must first accept that free gift of salvation by trusting the Lord Jesus and when you do that, you are then united with Christ in his death and his resurrection. Isn't that what we say when we baptize someone? Yeah, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So what do you have to do to spend eternity with the Father? You have to believe on the Son. It's that simple. So you might not be surprised to hear me uh, ask you this question on resurrection or Easter Sunday. Uh, do you know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven? Uh, uh, let, me, let me check pulses again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I need an oximeter or something. <laughs> Was the answer yes? yes? Now, some might be saying, I'm not so sure. I don't know. You know, um, it, it's like that old saying, just because something's in a garage doesn't mean it's a car, right? Just because we're sitting in a church does not mean we're believers. So how can a person be 100% sure that when they die, they're going to heaven? Well, let's take a look at this. First, admit that you're a sinner. Now, why do we say this? Well, because what do we talk about? Salvation. Well, salvation from what? Right? You, you go to a doctor and the doctor says you need an operation. What is the, what's important for the doctor to do first? Say, hey, you have this problem, you see. 
and, and it's a bad one, and this is why you need this operation. Otherwise, if they don't explain that, if you don't get it, then you might, not, you might say, forget the operation. So why do we need, why does anyone need to realize that they're a sinner first? Because that's why we need salvation. So as the Bible says, so everyone is a sinner. First of all, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 5, 12, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered, one man sin entered into the world, and that was Adam, right? And death by sin, so death passed upon men, for that all have sinned. So what's a very common belief? Well, I, I'm pretty good. You know, uh, hell is reserved for people like, like Hitler and, uh, you know, the really bad guys. Not for me. I, I do pretty much. What is this telling us? Everyone's a sinner. Everyone. There aren't heavenly scales. Well, my good outweighs my bad. It, it's, there's nothing like that in the Bible at all. We're all sinners. Period. So that's the first thing that we need to realize. And by the way, we sin through our actions. We sin through our thoughts. And we also sin through inaction, sins of omission. Look at James 4, 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So you're reading your Bible and it says, do this, make sure you do this, make sure you do this. And you have opportunities where you, you're supposed, you know, you see, but you don't do it. You know what that is? Sin. But a lot of people think, well, I didn't kill anybody. You know, I didn't cuss anyone out. You know, I didn't do this or that. But if you don't do the good that you know you're supposed to do, that's sin. So we're all sinners, every one of us. The second, so why is that a problem? What difference does it make that we're sinners? Well, the second, realize that the penalty for your sin is an eternity in hell. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, period. That's it, eternal separation from the Father. But there's good news. There's a remedy for all of this. There's a, you don't have to, um, you don't have to, as a sinner, spend eternity separated from God. You don't have to uh, go to hell. And Why? Believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again from the dead to pay for your sins. Romans 5, 8, but God commandeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what did the Lord Jesus make clear? Either you are with him or you are against him. So before any of us got saved, before each of us got saved, what were we? We were against him. We were his enemies. We were, whether we knew it or not. We were. And so, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet against him, he died for us. So we all deserve to go to hell, every one of us. But the Bible tells us that Christ died for us. He took our punishment. Do you realize that? He lived a perfect sinless life, but he took on our, our sin as if he had been the one that did it, which obviously he hadn't. And so what does this tell us? Look at um, 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him, referring to the Lord Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. The Lord did for us. We, we wrote in the, uh, in the song, um, You Died for Us, Jesus, um, a line, uh, one of the verses, it says, uh, thank you for doing what we could not do ourselves. 
You cannot save yourself any more than you can pull your, yourself out of a swimming pool by the, by the hair. Actually, you have an easier time doing that than saving yourself. Okay. So the point is this. We couldn't pay for our sins and live. If we pay for our sins, we die. See the point? We die. So only the Lord Jesus could pay for our sins. And the only way to have that righteousness applied to us is to believe him, to trust him, that what he did was sufficient payment. Acts 16, 30 through 32. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Notice the Lord did not say, or, or I mean, notice, notice that he didn't say, um, go to church to be saved. Did he say that? Notice he didn't say, give money in the offering plate to be saved. Did he say that? No. Did he say, clean up your life to be saved and stop sinning to be saved? You know, it's no wonder people think they're not ready to be saved yet because they think they have to clean themselves up first. Well, if you're not saved, how do you even know what you're supposed to clean up? And how can you do it? You can't. And so he didn't say clean yourself up to be saved. He said believe, which means trust. Now, these things are all good things to do, right? Go to church service, you know, um, give uh, for the Lord's work, um, you know, um, work at um, cutting out these, these sins that you keep committing. These are all fantastic things, but they have nothing to do with salvation, with getting saved. And then receive that free gift of eternal life by trusting in Christ alone. As I mentioned, what is a free gift? It, uh, and the reason why, you might think it's redundant. Isn't a gift always free? It's not always free. That's the point. That's why we emphasize free gift. Because it's without strings. You know, you, you have to do this or you have to do that. You have to do the other. Jesus paid it all. All we're doing is accepting it through faith. So look at Romans 623 for the wages of sin of de is death but the what's the next word yes. gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord it's a gift ephesians 2 8 and 9 for by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the yes. of god not of works lest any man should boast because god knew we would boast well, look at me, I'm going to heaven, right? Because I'm righteous enough, aren't I? Yeah. How do I know 100% for a fact, for sure that I'm going to heaven? Because salvation has nothing to do with me. If it had to do with me, I would be packing my bags for hell right now. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on the cross for me. Praise God and for you. Romans 5.18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men uh, to condemnation, referring to Adam, even so, by the righteousness of one, the Lord Jesus, the, what are the next two words? Free gift. Free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So salvation, getting saved, has nothing to do with our acts of righteousness. You can't work your way into heaven. It has everything to do with our belief, our faith, period. And by the way, you cannot work your way into heaven and you cannot work your way out of heaven either. Praise God, Praise God. right. Otherwise, uh, it'd be a waste of time. You know, it, I keep losing it, you know, right? you know. 
I mean, come on, really? Look at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted, that after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase possession unto the praise of his glory. So when we are saved, when we are saved, we are granted eternal life, everlasting life at that very moment. Everlasting life is forever. So at that moment you say, yes, Lord, I believe. Then the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost comes into you. You are sealed with the Holy Ghost and you are granted everlasting eternal life. <laughs> I don't know if you want to eat that. Um, okay. So now, here's the thing. Well, well let me ask you something. Uh, so each of those things that, that you you saw, you know, um, uh, admit that you're a sinner, realize that the penalty for sin is the eternity in hell, um, believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he came to the earth, that he lived a perfect sinless life, that he uh, then uh, died on the cross for our sins, was buried on the third day, rose again, that it's his payment, uh, his righteousness applied to us that saves us, not our actions, our works. That salvation has nothing to do with us. Do you believe that? Yeah. If you believe that, you are saved. Amen. You are saved. You don't need to pray a prayer. You, you know, you don't have, if you say it, you know, yes, I believe, you are saved. You are saved. Now, you can pray a prayer if you want, but you don't have to. You are saved. Look at Romans 10, 9 through 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. Right? Yeah. Period. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what I'm saying is if you believe these things and there's no yes but, if you believe these things, you are saved, period. And if you believe this for the first time today, just now because you heard the gospel, be sure to tell me after the service. And if you don't believe it, you think it's a bunch of nonsense, please see me after the service as well, okay? I'll spend all day with you if you'd like to show you how you can know for sure. And it's not Aldo Pucci saying it, it's God saying it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We pray that your name always be hallowed. Um, thank you for sending your son to save us. Thank you for, um, for oh Lord, the, the price that he paid for our sins. Thank you for bringing him out of that tomb alive, conquering death, showing the world that indeed he is the Christ. He is God in the flesh. And Father, help us to share the gospel with, with all of those around us you know, beginning in our communities and in all these communities surrounding our church building and in our own communities where we live. Because we know, Lord, that one day our Lord Jesus is returning. And when he returns, um, uh, he's, going to, uh, he's going to eliminate all unrighteousness. And the unbelievers will be on the wrong side of this. 
And we want to help them to avoid that, Lord. We want them to spend eternity with you as we know you do. But you have tasked us to share the gospel. And so, Lord, please help us to do that. We thank you, God. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. Amen.